While I was in Florida, I managed to capture this beautiful colony of graceful twig ants. I've wanted a colony of twig ants for a while now, but they've always proved to be too difficult for me to catch. In fact, it took me 4 out of the 9 days I was down in Orlando to catch them, and now that I could finally cross the species off my bucket list of ants to keep, I could begin to experience what it's like to have a real colony of twig ants, one with a queen, workers, and brood. The colony consists of one queen, 20 workers, and a hefty amount of brood, aka baby ants. As of now, these ants are in a simple yet effective setup known as a tubs and tubes setup. Everything looked to be fine until I noticed that this colony wasn't eating anything I had given them. I mean, they had some honey stored away in some of the workers' abdomens, but that was pretty much it. And in order for this colony to thrive, like actually grow, they need to consume both sugars and proteins. So far, they only had sugars and didn't want anything to do with protein-rich foods, which in most cases happens to be other bugs. I felt like their current home was just a little too humid, and maybe that's why they didn't want to eat. It was hard to see into their setup at times, which also made it difficult to tell if the colony was okay or not. So I got to work, and began making them a new tubs and tubes setup. To make a tubs and tubes setup is quite easy. All you need is a container of some sort, some sand, and of course, the test tube for the ants to live in. It's also very important that you do not forget the escape prevention barrier so that your ants don't escape. I personally like to use Biformica PTFE as my barrier, but if you don't have any, you can always give these other methods a try. To move the ants, I started off by removing the lid to the current setup. Then I began picking out the workers one by one. These featherweight forceps allow me to grab the ants without putting too much pressure on their exoskeletons. When enough workers were moved out, I picked up their test tube with my fingers and carefully placed it into their new tubs and tubes set up. I then went back to get the rest of the workers and luckily throughout this whole ordeal, I didn't get stung. Now that the colony was in a seemingly better circumstance, I wanted to take this moment to share with you just how cool these ants actually are. Let's first take a look at the foraging workers, those being the workers running around outside the nest looking for food. I noticed one thing about these ants that kind of makes me laugh every time I see it. Anytime these twig ants run, they sort of bolt around and then stop almost as if they move too fast for themselves and have to refocus every few seconds before running again. Another thing I noticed is that they have incredible eyesight. The eyes on each of these workers are quite large and allow for a wide angle view of its surroundings. It's also why they're incredibly difficult to catch. They can see you coming from a mile away in the opposite direction they're facing. Covering the floor of the entire tube are just heaps of brood. They are the eggs, the larvae, and pupae, but somewhere in the middle of the tube is actually the queen. Let's see if you can spot her. Right there, that slightly larger ant, believe it or not, is the colony's queen. The queen is essentially the heart of the colony, and without her, the rest of the colony will sadly die off. So the workers need to do their best to tend to the queen every second of the day. The way twig ant workers protect their queen is rather unorthodox. While most pieces of ants, when threatened or disturbed, bring their queen deeper into the nest, these twig ants instead grab their queen and run as far from the nest as they can with her. This behavior is called tandem running and is a common practice amongst these twig ants. Usually they pick up a fellow worker, or in our case, the queen, and bring each other wherever they want to go. After the queen was brought back into the tube, I remember that this colony was still super hungry and looking for food. Knowing they have I haven't eaten any insects since I had them, I felt like now was the perfect time to give them something. And so, a semi-crushed mealworm was tossed into their outworld. After a few ants ran by the mealworm, giving it no mind, I realized that maybe they just didn't want it. I know they have a sweet tooth, so instead of the mealworm, I gave them a generous drop of fresh honey. And they were quick to start lapping it up. It's so cool watching the ants as they drink. Here we can see as this worker uses its mouth parts to drink the honey drop. A lot of people actually get the ants mandibles confused with their actual mouths. Just for reference, these right here are their mandibles, and these are the ants mouth parts. By the next morning, the leaf had folded over onto itself, and judging by the fact that the workers were no longer headed in its direction on purpose, I felt like it was time to remove it. After opening the lid, however, I quickly realized that the barrier had become ineffective overnight, and the workers began to escape. It was likely because I don't have a vent on the lid allowing for the humidity to escape the container. This just means that the water vapor condenses on the barrier, allowing the ants to run right past it. I figured I would fix that later because I wanted to try and feed these ants again. I read online that in the wild, these ants hunt live Lepidopteran larvae, which is just a fancy way of saying caterpillars. I breed mealworms for my other ant colonies, and while they aren't technically caterpillars, they're the closest thing I had, so I tossed a small one in there to see what they would do. The mealworm ran around the entire container a couple of times on skates, but eventually, it would be approached by a foraging worker. The twig ant runs up to the mealworm and launches its first attack. It was short-lived, however, because the worker retreated right after. I didn't understand that at first, but the mealworm, despite being a fairly small one, was still too big for these ants. 
I needed a smaller mealworm. So I found the smallest mealworm I could find and tossed that one in as well. This time the ants behaved a little bit different. Just watch. After introducing the new smaller mealworm into the ants enclosure, one of the workers took it amongst herself to go hunt it. And instead of just attacking to then run away, she attacked again and again several times. After getting distracted with the bigger mealworm again, she chased a smaller one into the direction of another worker. This other worker wasted no time and attacked the small mealworm head on with his sharp piercing mandibles. Soon after, her sisters joined in on the attack and some of them even started to eat it. This lasted for a good five minutes, and out of nowhere, they all just decided to leave. The ants were attacking and even eating the mealworm, but for some reason, they all suddenly stopped in their tracks. There was either something wrong with the mealworm I had given them, or they just didn't have the taste for it. I was running out of time, however, because instead of feeding their larvae other insects, the colony would begin to feed the weaker larvae to the stronger larvae, and that means that less workers will be closed when they inevitably mature. I had another option, however. Fish food. I've had ants in the past that loved fish food, so I decided to give it a try with these twig ants. I sprinkled some in their outworld right next to their tube. They investigated the fish food, but overall just ignored it. I felt like it was over for this colony. They weren't eating anything, and sooner or later, they would probably starve to death. I was actually going to completely give up, but I remembered that it had a roach farm, and that might have just saved this colony. I took a small roach and placed it on its back so that the ants could sting it without having to flip the roach over themselves, and it actually almost worked. One of the workers grabbed onto the roach and started to drag it towards the nest, where it managed to sting the roach one good time on its leg. I felt like the roach, despite being the smallest one I could find, was still too big for the workers to take down by themselves, so I crushed the roach to the best of my ability and placed it back inside the outworld. At this point, the ants began to nibble at the roach and lap up some of the hemolymph seeping out of it. Hemolymph is, in simple terms, insect blood. Anyways, this process of nibbling and licking lasted for several hours. The ants at one point started bringing roach pieces into the nest to feed the rest of the colony, and watching as I did that was so relieving because it meant that this colony was no longer starving themselves, and I had finally found something that they would eat and feed to each other. I also felt much better about myself as an ant keeper. I didn't give up, and instead, I kept trying despite all the disappointments throughout this journey. By the next morning, the ants had completely hollowed out the roach, and all that was left was the outer shell. I was so happy to see that this colony had finally eaten something I had given them, and I can't wait just to see how well they will do in the future. These twig ants are just one of many species of ants that I'm currently keeping. I also have carpenter ants, harvester ants, and even a bullet ant queen. I've already uploaded a video about my leaf cutter ants in one of my old carpenter ant colonies, so be sure to check those out. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.